I'm Malcolm Hull. I'm the I'm the chair of the the Hearts and Middlesex Basfly Conservation Branch. So welcome to to everybody. Welcome to those that are members and also to to those that are non-members. Um, we've extended the invitation a little wider than usual today, um, but we're quite interested to find out where you all come from. So we're going to do a little poll at the end just so you can let us know how you heard about the talk. Um, just while we're um, getting started, a couple of um, announcements. Um, this, this is one of a series of talks. Our next one is going to be on Wednesday, the 3rd of March, uh, by Roger Gibbons, who will be looking at um, how to identify lookalike UK butterfly species, a subject that uh, a lot of us have spent a lot of time pondering on. So Roger's going to help with a few um, good illustrations and some wise advice on what we should look for when we're um, telling butterflies apart in the field later on. Um, and also just a reminder that we, we're ru currently running our photo competition. Um, we've got our, we're coming up to our annual members day on the 27th of March. Um, and anyone that wants to uh, can enter photos they've taken, provided they've taken them in the, in the last year and haven't, haven't digitally enhanced them. Um, there's information on the, on the website about how to enter the competition, which um, basically involves emailing it to, to Andrew Wood. Um, so if you have got some great photos and you would like to see them featured in, in our, at our Members' Day, then do, um, do send them to Andrew and there will be prizes um, awarded for the best, uh, best categories. So that's the announcements. Um, so turning on now, I'd like to introduce um, Sharon Hurl, who's our speaker this evening. Um, Sharon is going to talk on the role of the Eastern Regional Conservation Manager, um, which is actually the title of her job. Um, so that she, she, one she should know well. Um, Hearts of Middlesex, as, as you probably know, is part of the eastern region of butterfly conservation, which um, stretches up as far as such uh, northern points as Northamptonshire and uh, Norfolk, as well as uh, east to Essex. So quite a big region for, for Sharon to look after, um, and one that she's been dealing with now for, I think, about 18 years. She's always, she's ably assisted by um, her dog, Bree, a Jack Russell Terrier, which accompanies her on all her trips and site visits and is an expert now at finding rare butterflies and moths. So to tell us all about what she's up to, we'll um, hand over to Sharon. Perhaps you would share your screen, Sharon, and we can... Hello. <laughs> I don't know if you can, yeah, I'll share my screen. Is it shared? It says, yes. It doesn't look shared to me on mine, but can you hear me? We can hear you. Can not you hear me? Hear you, we can see you, but not your screen. It says host disabled participant screen sharing when I attempt to share it at the moment. Oh, well, it's... I'm meant to be a host, aren't I? I think on this. Thank you. So, I've just clicked something which might um, okay. help. Do you want okay. to try again? Oh, yes. I think that's worked. Yeah. You see me now. <laughs> I'm trying to share it. Has that worked? Yep. Can see the yes, that's worked. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it is weird, this Zoom thing, isn't it? Yeah, so I've been I've had the privilege of being the regional manager for um, butterfly conservation for yes, it is eighteen years, and some of you listening will remember me, <laughs> the really small baby who is now at university. So, God, it's a long time, but it has been a wonderful opportunity to get to know all the rare species in um, the eastern region. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my role really and how it links with everything that uh, the, the branches do and of course all the volunteers do and how how sort of i interact with that and then that's for the first half of the talk and then the second half i'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about the four spotted moth <clears throat> in particular if you like as an example of one of the the projects that uh, i've been i've been working on in the region and it covers sort of three three counties. So if 
I start from the beginning, um, is my screen appearing on your screens? As, as yeah, no, that looks better, Sharon. We can see yeah, the we can see it in the live, live view now. Oh, that looks looks brilliant. better. All oh, right, that's great. So, so there's a lovely little small blue, which is one of our priorities. So the first slide here, it, it might look like a bit of a, don't worry about all those numbers and X's and L's. It's just a little snapshot from our conservation um, regional strategy, which is what I work to. So we've got that on the website, which has all the details behind it, how we've arrived at the priorities <clears throat> and where these priorities are in which landscapes and in which branch areas. But you can see we've got, species like the wood white, which I'm going to talk about in a little while, um, checkered skipper, and we talk about that in Northamptonshire, uh, and grizzle skipper and dingy skipper, which are in most of the counties that I cover. So that's sort of the framework to which, which I work to. These are the, the priorities that we've set, and, and that's and conservation of those but butterflies and moth, and the corresponding moths are, are what I, I work, work on. And the idea of the strategy is, is to measure the progress we're making. So in the different landscapes and in the different areas, the, the progress we're making, whether it's unknown, can't do everything, can't be everywhere, whether it's occasional recording of target species, almost most places have some of that, limited conservation delivery, where we've got some coordinated surveys, um, some conservation work and site recovery work to full recovery and that's I don't think you can ever have full recovery but at least when we've got a project running with a member of staff and we're delivering a certain amount of work I think we get close to that and then we can put a green dot in our strategy. So grizzle skipper is one species that is a priority species and that is present in every county except for Suffolk in my region. There's only one site left in Essex now, which is dreadful. And, but we do have in Hertfordshire and Middlesex approximately five sites. And if you like that for me, for me in Hertfordshire and Middlesex is quite a, it, the, the, it, um, the, the work by the volunteers is, is doing really well, that the, the monitoring is good, uh, either by transect, or by time counts, or by distribution survey, which of course informs the habitat management, which is really, really important. For this particular species, it can go wrong very quickly. And it's when it starts to go wrong, perhaps is that's when I'm brought in to try and help branch volunteers to, to help put that right. But not always needed. Um, in many cases, the volunteers can, can do a great job on their own with the land managers um, that they can know very well. <clears throat> There's a recent paper by Fiona Bell, which um, has confirmed the importance of habitat condition on that one. And that's well worth a read if any of you um, haven't seen that. It, it's freely available um, on, on uh, open source website to get hold of that. So read what the um, annual reports uh, um, produce. So all the uh, recorders usually produce an annual report of, of what they find. And I do look at those. That is part of my role to, to, to see what's been said. Here's a little extract from Hearts and Middlesex about the grizzle skipper. And, and looking at that can give me a good idea of, of, of how well it's being managed, for instance, in, in Hertfordshire. And if any, any alarm bells are ringing and perhaps intervention is needed. So this is a small extract from the annual report in Hertfordshire that, that, that's excellent. And I, I see them for Norfolk for the transects and I see them for Northamptonshire and Bedfordshire and um, Essex and Suffolk. So there's quite a lot to look at, but they're really valuable reports and I do appreciate um, being able to have a look at those. Um, but often where I get involved is, is, is actually with habitat on the ground and this is a view of fabulous grizzle skipper habitat. Uh, Judy who's listening will know where this is, um, this is on the Cut Off channel 
And this is a site that we are desperately needing to do some work on to combat encroaching scrub. This is a good patch on this area that you're looking at. See all the wonderful <clears throat> open nectar. Um, the rabbits are creating some good disturbance there. So we've got some bare ground. And the shrubs aren't too numerous here, but in other places, it's much more of a problem. So this is where, as regional manager, we will come in and try and <clears throat> work with the landowners, land managers, um, to try and, um, if, if need be, to start to restore that site if it needs uh, work doing. And it certainly does in this particular case. Um, Another big landscape that, um, that in my region that's really important is the Brex. And I've spent quite a, a bit of my work time in this landscape on various projects. We've got lots of, I know, for the Brex is the area of Thetford, Norfolk and Suffolk uh, in the sort of the middle of the region. Thetford in the middle, Brandon and uh, Munford, that kind of landscape, A11 goes through it. And this has got lots and lots of our priority species. So lots of that regional strategy are found in this landscape. And hence that's a landscape that gets, gets my attention working with landowners such as the Forest Commission and private farms and various other uh, wildlife trust managed land to make sure that our rare species here uh, get a look in. <clears throat> We've got things like the micro moth Coleophora tricolor, the basil thyme case bearer, which is only found here in the UK in, in the Brex. It's right up there with our priorities to make sure that um, that is managed for and that the sites, and it hasn't got many sites left, so we can't. Um, can't leave it unattended too long. Um, so so that's, that gets my attention in these areas. And you can see some of the other species in this, in, on the map that, that get attention. Marsh carpet down the bottom here is really raising alarm bells at the minute. And that's one that we're going to be working on in 2021. We're getting very concerned about that one. And because on a national scale, it's not been seen in Yorkshire, in Nottinghamshire, in Lincolnshire, and even in the Netherlands, they're saying that it's being lost to, um, for various reasons. That leaves our eastern region as a really important place for that moth. A few sites in the Brex for it, and then we've got the Norfolk Broads. So, <coughs> excuse me, that's um, one that we will be focusing on in 2021. So um, I thought I might show you this a little piece of habitat here in the Brex. This is the Suffolk Brex and some of the work we do with, with again, with volunteers, not just me. This is um, to undertake rigorous recording to help us understand the impact. We want to know what the impact of our of habitat management is. And then this particular slide, I think you can just about see some of the bare ground strips that we've started to implement on these big open spaces in Thetford Forest. This is King's Forest, because monitoring is telling us that this, is, this works a treat for grayling. And grayling is really struggling in, in the Brex. Not so bad on the coast, another priority species, not doing so good in the Brex, but creating these um, disturbed corridors through open habitat appears to be working well for the grayling. And if you see the little picture there, there's a little egg in the middle of it. And that's almost certainly why the grayling needs this kind of egg laying opportunity. And it needs the very fine grasses that follow on from the disturbance in order for it to survive. So working with the Forestry Commission, they have got the potential to implement this kind of strips of bare ground right across their right network where it's appropriate. And that's what we'll need for the grayling in order for it to have a chance 
it can't survive on one ride. It needs a whole network of sites and other landowners to join in with this really simple kind of management. So it's the same machine as would cut, cut the grass, mow it, would instead just break up the grass sward. It works brilliantly for our other priority species. Uh, we do time counts for the lunar yellow underwing moth and the time counts over winter for the caterpillars are really good in this site. This is my go-to site now um, to compare all the others with to see how many larvae we've got here. Also get forester moth here and really high numbers of small heath and the small copper. So I think this is quite a good example of um, a priority landscape, priority species, working with volunteers and then with landowners and then understanding what impact interventions have and then continuing um, to do that work on a larger scale. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we've been working in partnership. So the role of the regional manager is also to um, either work in collabor collaboration with others on big funding packages or to find funding ourselves for work. That's going to be really hard going forward. But this, the Shifting Sands, the Back from the Brink project, is a huge um, national partnership project. And we've been working in collaboration with them on two projects in my region. Steam Sands is, is the one in the Brex. And this is slide here is an example of um, the Forest Corridors project, which is a step on from the slide I showed you previously with some of the disturbance strips. These are big corridors that we've created in King's Forest. And this is a, <clears throat> a little piece of mosaic management that we did in one area, which I'm hoping will be really good for Dingy Skipper, where we've left um, islands of nice vegetation and then taken away some of the um, thicker, denser grass and bracken material to get a mosaic of habitat back. And we would have liked to have monitored this in 2021, but Dingy Skipper's May, so we had to let that one go, lockdown. Um, and hopefully this year we'll be out there and um, finding out whether this work really has paid off and we've had the impact that we hoped. So Roots of Rockingham is another Back from the Brink, it's the second Back from the Brink project that I'm sure you've all heard about um, in the Northamptonshire part of my region. And a big part of that has been to reintroduce this wonderful uh, little butterfly, the checkered skipper. Now that's a whole talk on its own. And I think some of you may have heard it from Susanna or perhaps one day we'll get the opportunity to, because that is a whole topic on its own. It's going really well. And the butterfly um, has, has, has re-emerged after being released which is great and we are nervously waiting this year to hope that we have even more sightings of them. Um, this one um, also includes um, a PhD study. This is something head office um, have been coordinating mainly. Um, and then we've got other volunteers obviously uh, out um, surveying for the for the adults and also for the caterpillars, much more difficult, I have to say. <laughs> and as well as um, the checkered skipper in the roots of Rockium, there were a whole host of other priority species that were on our list or on our radar to find out more about. And that's often the opportunity is when you're able to either work in partnership with other agencies, or you're able to apply for a big lottery project yourself, is that you can work on other priority butterflies and moths at the same time. And here is no exception. It's been a real surprise at how many grizzled and dingy skippers there were in the forest rides. Um, didn't realize that that habitat was actually quite so good in Northamptonshire for these two species. 
we've found wood white in new locations. Uh, the Rocky and Forest is quite a vast network of woodlands and wood white is there. We don't know how long it's been there or whether it's moving northwards, but nevertheless, we've found brand new colonies of this butterfly. And it's enabled us, um, was able Susanna, to work with um, landowners on their forest grants that they get to make sure that the implementation of those grants means that the habitat for the wood white is enhanced so that the mowing takes place on alternative turnip rides. And she's had lots of success with that. So we've got good results for the, for the wood white. We've also found black hair streak much more widespread than we expected. And again, this is really helpful to, to know where these colonies are because the Forestry Commission, when they're doing all sorts of different management techniques, it can be really valuable that we can, um, if they're doing a big ride clearance, we can have, um, ensure that we can mark up the blackthorn for this black hair streak butterfly so that it doesn't all get mown uh, and taken out. We can keep it going. <sighs> And the tiny little licorice piercer managed to, Susanna's chuffed a bit because I know she managed to find that a, a, a number of, a new site after being there for three years looking for it and, and has managed to find it. So it's great opportunity to, to, to look for other species at the same time as, as doing the other project. We have the Woodland Wings project, which is also, this is in South Northamptonshire, which Caroline Temple's been running. This comes to an end um, in April this year. Uh, Liz Morrison is currently running um, the last two months of this project for us. And it involves lots of events. Uh, Lottery do like us to do events. And we were able to do lots of moth trapping events, moth mornings, um, guided walks, and lots of uh, work parties. So this was great, great project in that respect. And we've got new transects being walked now in Salsi Forest, in the South North Hampton Cheer Woodlands. So going forward, we're going to have a really good um, idea of our butterfly um, numbers, in, um, which is a really good legacy. We also tried out biomass um, uh, ride clearance methods here, which was um, it's quite drastic kind of uh, ride management, but nevertheless, it, it provides really good um, follow-up habitat for, for, for wood white butterfly. So we've been able to try sort of new management techniques with the Forestry Commission that we perhaps wouldn't have been able to uh, try before. And that's something they can go on and do because we can't always get be sure we'll get lottery money in the future. So the very fact that the Forestry Commission are now much more knowledgeable about these species and able to implement management um, uh, management practices that um, put forward good butterfly habitat in the future. In fact, this morning, I, for the first time, I had a phone call from a contractor who had been instructed by the Forestry Commission to ring us before he started cutting the forest ride in South North Hans. I don't think I've ever had that before. And I was able to explain directly, this is the chap on the tractor <laughs> who's going to be cutting the rides to explain to him um, a bit more about the specifics of the particular ride he was about to cut so that he could actually cut um, not all of it. But we didn't want all the ride cut. And I was able to explain to him on the phone because the Forestry Commission had asked him to contact us before. So that's really quite, I do regard that as a bit of progress. So, moths. Um, our strategy, our East of England strategy, obviously includes the moths, and there are many, many more moths in it than the butterflies, and there is much less known about them. So that is a priority for, for, for myself as regional manager to encourage more of um, more conservation and more recording of moths to take place and, and particularly in our priority groups. And that brings me on to the sort of the second part of the talk I was going to do today is about one of those moths 
and some of the work that we've been doing in the region to help it. So that's the four spotted moth. And here it is with a helpful hand so you can see the scale of it. It's a day flying moth, which actually makes it more of a, perhaps, perhaps more of a joy to work on. Certainly easier to work on than some of the others because it is a day flying moth. And here's the kind of landscape it covers. Landscape that stretches from Newmarket, so just into Suffolk, across Cambridgeshire on the sort of chalk ridge, and then into the top end of North Hertfordshire. So this is in this, um, this is where I've been working on it. Um, the moth does occur elsewhere in the region as well. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. We've got other priority species in this landscape. So chalk carpet on the barest of chalk, dingy skipper in a handful of patches. Dark green fertility, I saw lots more of those this year and much wider area. And I'm sure others of you listening did as well. And then there are other species in this landscape as well. So the, the four spotted moth feeds on field bindweed, which is not exactly rare. But of course, the moth itself is extremely restricted <clears throat> because it needs its field or bindweed in the hottest and driest and most sparse locations that we have, which why it takes it up to the high areas of chalk on this thin and bare soil that you get in North Hertfordshire, Cambridgeshire and Essex. This map here is an extract from the marvellous Moth Atlas produced in 2019 by Butterfly Conservation. And on here, you can see um, where it used to be, all the yellow dots, so much, much more widespread than it is now, which is the very dark blue dots um, of more recent times. It is a, a migrant. So as you can see, the scatter along the coast sort of illustrates um, some of that. And it does pop up sometimes in unexpected places. But the core area is this area that I'm looking at is this, this little bit in the middle. Um, Cambridge, Essex, North Hertfordshire. So it likes um, banks and road verges and field margins, but it's got lots to contend with in this landscape. It's got overgrowth of grass and shrubbery and bramble on some of the lovely banks, as in this picture. And then it's got potential heavy repetitive mowing, which is not great either in some other cases. So we've got quite a bit to deal with. It loves nectar. When you're looking for four spotted moth, um, it loves flowers. Um, in the early part of the season, it likes oxide daisy and field bindweed. But later on, uh, July um, time, it's often found at mallow, knapweed, or even marjoram. So it'll, it'll, it's not overly choosy, but these are good places to find it, flowery places. I think in the old reports, it was in clover fields and vetch fields. So it just loves flowers. And here's another, this bank is not far from the Little Bree railway crossing. And it used to look like this. I've got one of my old photos out. And it used, it doesn't look like this now. It's much, much more overgrown. But it did used to look like this with the, just the bindweed tumbling down the, the edge of the bank there. And they can quickly lose condition. So I've been trying to get funding for this project from the lottery and to, to, to implement Habitat Works. However, didn't, didn't manage to, to get it. Quite a tricky project perhaps to get Lottery to fund. However, this kind of thing has been appearing across the whole landscape 
where farmers have been creating these ditches, shallow ditches between um, their field and the road verge. And this is actually to stop, as I've discovered, the hare courses from being able to access their big open fields and, and chase hares. So these have created some really quite valuable habitat for the four spotted moth and lots of other arable fauna as well. And in recent years, um, the records for this moth have been most numer numerous in conjunction with these um, new ditches. So this here doesn't look particularly promising. This is a road verge in Duxford in Cambridgeshire, but for the last three years running, I've managed to find four spotted in that ditch. Um, is it, you can't see the ditch terribly well in that picture, but there is a shallow ditch, just like the previous picture, and four spotted likes that ditch. It's got nectar, it's got field bindweed growing in a hot, sparse environment. How long it will last, I don't know. We don't know, and that's where repeated monitoring will, will help tell us that. But it, it, it appears there um, regularly. And these are other ditches. This is a ditch at a slightly different perspective, a different, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, aspect. And I haven't found them there yet. But this one here um, in the vicinity of Melbourne found several there. These are the ones on the, on the mallow. So very open ditch. Um, very open landscape but on these light soils you get lots of nectar and lots of field bindweed in a hot dry and sort of very sunny situation this one this is another site where we get good numbers of um four spotted so one of the things that can go wrong for four spotted is actually planting hedges and planting trees it needs an open an open landscape where the, the soil can bake hot. We think that the habitat I'm looking at here could be oh, could be a lot better uh, the, than that one. I'll come back to that a bit later. Even though the four spotted is still there on the previous slide I've just shown, it could still be better and there could still be more four spotted. They're just sort of clinging on. So last year, um, when lockdown was released and I was out of furlough, I did spend some time on the public byways in um, Hertfordshire around Ashwell and Bygrave to see if we could find four spotted there. So this is one image, couldn't find it. Now what I obviously don't know at the minute is if it, I was there on the, about the 20th of um, July, was that too late? The other sightings in Cambridgeshire on the 13th, that's a whole week later, was that too late? Um, or is the habitat just not suitable for it? It looks a lot more overgrown in this picture here. Is, is that too far gone? Plenty of bindweed, all that there is a straggle of bindweed, but that may not be good enough for um, the four spotted. This is another image of um, the byway in Bygrave in North Hertfordshire, not far from Ashwell. Um, it's had this rather unfortunate treatment here um, where lots of rubble has been spread out along the whole length of it, which makes it a nightmare for cycling on. <laughs> um, but it does also get covered in field bindweed in quite a, um, to quite, quite a hot environment potentially for the caterpillar to survive on. And the tractor, the, the, the ridges there where the bike is, you can see I mean, I, when I was there, I was thinking, oh, some of them could create just the right conditions for the caterpillars. There's certainly plenty of field bindweed. So maybe next year, maybe 2021, um, the moth will be found here. It was found in the past in Ashwell, and it's really intriguing to think that this landscape so close to the Cambridgeshire and Essex populations um, hasn't got it yet, or has it? This is one of the great unknowns. When you just go for a survey on one occasion, you don't necessarily know. 
um, a negative is a good record. I did find in this part area of um, um, North Hertfordshire lots of these. And this just shows the pace of change. I, when I saw these, I thought, my goodness, I thought they were rare. And of course, in Colin Plant's book, Moths of Hertfordshire, he says they were rare, extremely rare resident, and hardly any dots on the map. But when I, I found them on almost every field scabious I saw in this part of Bygrave and Ashwell, and I also found it in Cambridgeshire. And of course, when I checked at the more up-to-date maps for uh, North Hertfordshire moths, I could see indeed it was reasonably well known in recent years from that part. So it just shows how quickly um, things can change and how species can be on the move. Some are on the move, some aren't. So even a negative survey, for instance, the four-spotted moth, finds lots of other things which, which makes it a useful survey. So that's another image um, after harvest of a four spotted site. So if any of you listening are thinking of um, helping next year, and I really hope you are, um, this kind of habitat works. Um, well, it's not ideal, don't get me wrong, it, but it is where we are finding it. Um, one of the places it's probably disappeared from is a lot of the road verges, which have become in more recent years, much more overgrown. This is a, a protected roadside verge, but it's not a patch on what it used to be. And perhaps some of the passion and for leaving our road verges uncut is perhaps a bit unfortunate for some of our flora and fauna and perhaps certainly for the four-spotted moth, because as it's much more grassy, there are much less, less flowers and much le le less opportunity for nectaring butterflies and moths and for caterpillar fruit plants. That same kind of bird, if it gets cut earlier in the season, it can be a carpet of field bindweed and then possibly in this particular landscape where we've got this species, um, an important factor in keeping the moth in this in this area. So I thought I'd put together a, a few numbers from last year. Um, I haven't forgotten Colin Plant describing a hundred odd in 2001 in North Essex. The closest we've got to that is 38. And I remember Colin Plant telling me about that and he went back the following day and only found three or four. So, which is what we normally tend to find, that kind of number. So it's obviously incredibly rare to get a big, huge number like that, but it can happen. And um, what a sight it was for him. We've had 38 in 2019 recorded on one of those um, open ditches. And here are some of the other records from last year. You can imagine we didn't get so much done last year. We missed the first brood pretty much. Uh, and um, these are some of the others. So the numbers 4, 2, 12, uh, negative records, and then a few seen in August. I had one, um, amazingly enough, in my garden near Huntingdon, in, in August, <laughs> which are just incredible. And the last record for this area was 2002. I must admit, I'm waiting for one to appear in Liz Goodian's trap. That surely must be on the cards. So an interesting um, observation last year was the finding of four cat larvae. Um, Tony Davis from head office, head office and I head out during the dark because finding larvae we know can tell us a lot more about a species sometimes than just the adult. And this is something we want to do more on next year. The larvae we're on, this is four spotted larvae. We found four 
and we're in about an hour. There was a tremendous thunderstorm on that night. So we would have stayed out longer and done more, but th this was being out in the open countryside and thunderstorms, not safe. <laughs> so we, we had to limit at that, but we did find four and they were all on the slope, the southwest facing slope of one of those new roadside field ditches. So they, they were using the hottest, driest, barest bit of bindweed on that slope, just to get that little bit extra. It wasn't on the flat verge. Tony and I did look on the flat verge where there was plenty of bindweed. It was a carpet of bindweed. We didn't find them there. They were all on the straggly bindweed hanging down that bare bank. So that tells us quite a bit. This was the verge we found them on. The ditch is sort of hidden by the vegetation in this picture, but by August, um, it really was quite bare. And so um, 2021, um, we hope to do more survey work for Four Spotted and in particular for the larvae. So we hope um, some of the slides I showed you before, the farmer's tracks where we find, we do find some, but I said they could be much better. Um, we are convinced that if we were to work with these landowners to create little shallow dirt banks, little shallow ditches, and this isn't big work, this is just small scale, you know, the height of, of a ditch doesn't have to be very high. Um, either sides of these tracks still got the arable crop there and then allow these to become much more floristic with the bare ground, we could see much, much more, many more full spotted moths. And um, yeah, please do get involved. If you can next year, if we're all allowed out, please do get involved. The more recording, the better. I'd love to see a transect on this and I'd certainly like to see more um, uh, timed counts and a better coverage of, of that particular landscape. Um, I think that's probably everything I was going to say. And then we've got a chance for questions. And I'd really welcome any questions on anything you'd like to ask, either now or afterwards. Great. Well, thanks, Sharon. That's a, that's a really interesting talk. And um, <laughs> I'm hoping that, um, hoping we'll have a few questions. Um, there's um, one or two um, in, in the chat box, I think. Um, <coughs> but but um, before, we, um, before, we, before we go on to that, could, could you say just a little bit more about how we can get involved in helping with the, the four spotted moth? Um, I'm, I'm taking it from what you're saying, that recording is the main thing that you're, you're looking it's a big, for. It's a, yeah, it's a big landscape to cover and, and a short time period in which to cover it in. So yes, I would definitely welcome. And people can, can contact contact me, me direct. Yes, please do. Right, okay. And what sort of time of year was the best to, to go out You've looking got two, for? You've two chances. You've got June for the first brood, uh, and then into, into sort of mid-July is pro um, yeah, June into mid-July, so quite a, you can see from the records, it's a quite protracted, really. But yes, June into July is the best time. Cool. OK. Hot, um, sunny days. Lovely, um, hot, sunny days. Right. OK. Well, we're just looking at some of the questions. Um, Dick Ashford's asked, if we want to see some rare species, can we contact you for help, Sharon? <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah, do, do, do. Yes, do contact me and I'll do my best. Cool. Um, and Sue Taylor put in a comment about um, parasitoid wasps. Yes, I've just seen that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So that, that's how, how fascinating. Yes, of course. Yeah, I, I haven't noticed it. So I shall look. I shall look for next year. Yeah. Yes, I've not seen one of those either. No, no. So. 
Um, it's Sue here. If you want, I can send you, I've done a little brochure which shows the parasitoid and the moth and all together. Oh, would you? Oh, please do. Yeah, because yeah. I see I see that that moth um, all over, but I've never seen that parasitoid. Whereabouts are you seeing them, Sue? Um, anywhere I see scabious, really, and which has got the brassy longhorn on. So um, I've seen them on Ivinghoe. Um, most of the sites I go to are Bucks, but I have, I'm sure, seen it near Hexton as well, um, mm -hmm. up on the Hearts Cambridgeshire borders. Um, mm. Basically, anywhere where I've been, I've seen it. So it's worth other people looking out for it. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing how that moth has just expanded. I was astonished. Mm. Um. Well, is, is there anyone else would like to ask a question? I haven't got any more in the um, in the chat room, but um, feel feel free to unmute and ask a question. Do, don't all do it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a question. Okay. Can you hear? Yes, I we can hear. Yeah, tell us who you are and ask uh, okay. what's your question. So, so, despite the name you might see, that's the name of the computer. Uh, yeah. I am Chris Tyler Smith, oh, uh, and I'd like to ask on a slightly uh, different topic, if I if I can, and that's the licorice piercer moth, which showed up on a couple of your slides. Yes, yes. So, is there any coordinated work on that in this area? Um, we are. Yes, we are looking at that one in the Rockingham project, in the, in the Rockingham Forest project of Northamptonshire, where we've got a number of sites for that now, including some sites where we're concerned that the licorice gets cut at the wrong time. Mm. Uh, one place where the licorice not only gets cut, but the cuttings get taken away. So we've got to intervene there. And I'm aware that it's also uh, a number of places in Essex and also Cambridgeshire. Um, and here in my garden, I've got some wild licorice seeds overwintering, but I have, a f I have no idea really how difficult it is to grow the plants. But um, if they do succeed, they may go on to um, a road verge in Northampton where we think we have lost plant so if you've got any expertise or knowledge on that please do do, do. well so 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 we live in Cambridgeshire but very close to the Essex border yes uh, and and uh, uh, the the Cambridgeshire moth record of Bill Mansfield kind of yes <clears throat> asked us to get involved in in recording it and we we did rediscover it at one site in in South Cambridgeshire and, Brilliant. and uh, saw it at a, a, a couple of the known sites in, in North Essex. Yes. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, are wanting to look more broadly and also in, in more detail. And, and one of the sites that I, I think uh, you've probably seen it as Little Chesterfield. Yes, yes, I have. Uh, yes, and, and there it it's on a protected roadside verge. Yes, and that is fairly heavily cut, uh, but but and has been for years, I think. But the moth and the the licorice seem to do well there, and in in that case the the cuttings are just left in place, they're not removed. But if you look a few months later, they've gone. So it seems that they, they blow uh, away. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the Essex County Council are kind of very sympathetic to it and, and thinking about what is the best way to manage that and so you know if uh, 
uh, if there is any practical information, I think they would be receptive uh, to that, but yeah. having to you know, take into account everything else on the verge. Yeah, that would happily help if, if, if needed. That is one of our priority species. And as you say, it's only got a handful of sites and um, we wouldn't want it to go wrong. I know, I know the verge you're talking about. Uh, mm. Yeah. Thanks, Sharon. Um, Thank anyone else that, with, a, with a question? There's a comment from Derek Crump. I think that was Chris that just spoke, actually. Oh, yes, now I can see that. Yes, the landscape is quite intensively cult cultivated. And I would say, like many places, yes, there are some local farmers that are very interested in helping. And, and, and Liz on the call, we met a fabulous farmer, didn't we, in, in, in that area, who's doing a great job with his margins um, in, in, in uh, nectar-rich flowery margins that he's created on his farm so yes yes some are um, and, and some less less so but um yeah there's there's lots of scope i think for for um for, more, for farmers to to do a bit more uh with us there for that moth One thing that I wanted to ask Sharon is that yeah. two, two of the species that we're um, wanting to do more to help in, in Hearts and Middlesex uh, are the, the grizzled and dingy skippers, both of which um, used to be a lot more common um, historically than they are now in our area. But why is it, do you think, that they're, they're doing so much worse now than they, they used to? And, and what do you think we can do to help them? Oh yeah. Um, all I can, all I can really think from what other people have, have found in their areas is, is it it can go quickly wrong for those two species if you haven't got enough of the right habitat. So, for instance, I think a lot of the sites in in Hertfordshire are really now quite small. So you haven't got a landscape of lots of sites. So if you haven't got one site that's left in tip top condition for the larvae, then you're always up against it. If one year you don't get enough or the habitat isn't management isn't quite right or you get the wrong weather, then that population is really, really vulnerable. It's, it's a species that needs a landscape of sites and that's just so hard to achieve nowadays um, in some some areas so I think that's probably part of it and I think if you spoke to Mike Slater who's done a lot of work on those species he will say that the breeding habitat for the larvae is probably the most critical thing to have in that habitat for it to continue so that's the bare ground and the caterpillar food plants. Well, I mean, the grizzle skip is very often found on the gravel pits. Presumably, where there is new gravel pits turning up, isn't that a place to look, really? Uh, yeah, I think so. If it's in, if it's within the general flight area, and I think you've got evidence of finding it. In, I think um, a lot of the work that Liz and Andrew have done and others have found it in new gravel pits in the vicinity. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's quite a lot of it, yeah. But I mean, there are lots of gravel pits around Hertfordshire, so I'm sure if you can get access into them, they probably will find mm. the grizzle skipper. But it's a question yeah. of getting access into them, really. Yeah. Yeah, okay, well, that's something perhaps we should be trying to do a bit more of to get into more of these quarries that we haven't been into. Not always easy. <laughs> yeah. Working. I think one of one of the problems with with quarries. I know around St Albans area quarries that they used to live in is that once the um, gravel extraction finishes, then quite often there are agreements in place. Some going back many years that involve the the yeah. pits being infilled and then turned into um, uh, ordinary looking sheep pasture. 
um, to, to name one example that's happened not that long ago um, near to where I live. So that they, you know, they, they've been, the consents for extracting the gravels being given on the basis that they restore it to farmland afterwards, which is is probably what it was beforehand. But it, it, and it does seem to be very difficult to um, yeah, I think it overturn be. those sort of agreements, even though it's making great habitat for the butterfly. There are there are sort of obligations on the the quarry companies that they signed up to at the start, and and not necessarily very easy to get out from. Yeah, well, maybe it's something we could should have another look at and see whether times have changed and we can re-influence what happens to some of those sites if we can identify them. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be it would be helpful if we could if we had a sort of authoritative body of evidence that said that that was the the right you know it was it was bad practice now to fill in old gravel mm. pits um that might be quite helpful but whether whether we can actually get that together <laughs> i suppose it's thinking of everything holistically isn't it rather than just mm. one one individual butterfly is is the more the problem mm. Any others for um, questions before we wrap up? No, oh, looks like you're off the hook, Sharon. <laughs> Good. Okay, well, thanks everyone for, um, for coming. Um, I just want to, just a couple of things before we finish off. Um, I did um, want to just um, go back to the, uh, the book donation. We've had um, one bid. Um, which was from, let me see, right at the back, from Kevin Russ. Um, Kevin, if you if you want to, um, if you email me afterwards with your contact details, then I will um, I will give you the uh, the location for making the online donation and also pass your details on to um, on to Brian, who who will post you the um, post you the book. Um, okay. I guess the only thing you need is, have you got my contact details? Yes, I think I've emailed you before, so that's fine. Got you emailed. Yeah. Great. Yep. Okay, thanks very much. And then finally, I just wanted to um, to launch um, launch the poll so you can tell us how you, how you heard about the talk um, tonight and, uh, and what you thought about it. So um, I'm going to, uh, yeah, the first question is um, where you heard about it. And the second question is... Uh, did you enjoy it? So I'm going to launch the poll now and I'll give you a minute or so to um, think up of an answer. Can I fill it in? <laughs> Yeah, you, you, you can. I don't think I, I can't. I'm, I'm, only, I'm only able to look at the um, look at the answers. We hope you enjoyed it, Sharon. So we've got ninety percent of people have answered. Ninety five percent, ninety seven percent. So everybody except me, I think. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to end the polling, and um, I shall share the results. Which just like last time showed that um, about two thirds of people had heard about it from the email we sent out from um, from the head office computer and um, a smattering of other from websites, Twitters, Facebooks, and the like. And um, over eighty one percent of people enjoyed it. So um, well done, Sharon. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you can come again next year as a prize. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, uh, thanks every ever so much, everybody, for, um, for for joining. As I said, the, the next talk is uh, from Roger Gibbons on on the third of March, um, same place as this time, and um, hope to see you then. So, thanks ever so much, Sharon, and um, hope to see you all again on the third of March. Thank Love you. this, everyone. Cool. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Cheerio. I always learn so much. <laughs> I hope it warms up in North America soon. Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> cool. All right. Night all. Night. Night.